Uh, so welcome to the Courageous Nerd YouTube channel. I'm Connor and joining me today is Kevin Alves. Kevin, how are you doing? I'm, I'm great. I'm really happy to be here and talking to you. I'm really excited. Absolutely. And obviously, uh, you, you know, people know you as an actor. You've, you've done a few kind of big projects now and people might not know uh, you've got a background in figure skating as well. And I was wondering which of those two came first like, and do they intersect at all in your life? Uh, yeah, actually, um, I, it was really great. Um, when I was about six years old, uh, my sister was skating and my parents took me to a show and mm. um, I I really liked this uh, program. There's a famous skater named Kurt Browning who okay. he did this program called Ragatone and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. He has like a clown nose and he's, it's the coolest. <laughs> it's just amazing. Anyone who wants to see really cool skating, look up Kurt Browning Ragatone. But I went home and I told my parents that I want to skate. And so the next week my mom brought me home uh, hockey skates and mm. she's like here and I was like no and she's like what do you mean I got you hockey skates like you said you want to skate here you go and I'm like no I want skates like Kurt Browning so right at six I started in figure skates and by the time I was seven I had just gone I was a kind of independent kid who watched a lot of tv and and got up on my own at 7 a.m to watch like the new episode of Power Rangers or whatever mm. it was and uh and so by the time I was seven I knew that I wanted to skate and then I wanted mm. to be an actor and they were like, I never looked back. I just ran with it. I've kept running with it and I'll keep running with it until, I, until I'm forced into doing anything else ever. But I love this. And uh, um, they did intersect for a bit because I competed internationally for about 10 years from, from the time I was like 16. Mm. And um, when I was about 19, I started acting by going to like studios and doing some lessons. And I got a couple of small roles um, and I was still competing as a skater for a couple of years in the middle there. And then mm. I kind of started to take it more seriously once I stopped uh, skating. And that was probably the toughest because when I stopped skating is also when I stopped booking roles. And so right. I, had a, I had a little period of time there where it was like yeah. a panic. Like, what am I doing with my life here? But um, I just stayed committed to it. And then, uh, you know, a couple of years later, things started to come together and I just tried to grow as an artist as best that I could and then stuff started to happen so I kind of yeah uh they do intersect I think because I I didn't have the nerves that I thought I would as an actor because I was used to performing in front of 5,000 people so it was different mm -hmm. you know it was it, but it definitely intersected I don't think I'd be acting the way I am today if I hadn't been a skater for that long you know Absol absolutely and I know like how seriously Hollywood takes and like keeping actors safe in productions and stuff but do you think then if, if you ever ended up being cast as a skater that you'd get to do most of that, the physical stuff yourself or they rely on a double to do it? No, I, I actually had two production. I've almost done two or three different productions that were all skating related. Right. And, um, they've fallen through. One of them, I was under contract for another show with Amazon at the time. So I couldn't do this show. And then there were two other ones that uh, we just didn't think were the right project at that time. But for all of them, I think the discussion was is that I would get to do all my stunts and we would have someone there for, I think one of them, we had some pair stuff and I didn't do a lot of pairs. So I'd have a pair double, but for any of the jumps or any of like the skating stuff on, on the ice, I think it would be silly for me not to, like I spent my whole life doing it. So I think, I think we'd get away with getting to do all of it, which would be cool. Sure. And you might have to correct my research here a little bit, just in case I've got anything wrong, but obviously we're talking before the call. So you're born in Canada, but you present like Brazil at a national level for, for the skating, right? Yeah, my entire, uh, my, the mom, my mom's side of the family, she's from Brazil, and uh, that federation really supported me through my teenage years, and so I competed for Brazil um, when I was competing internationally, and uh, it was really cool, because I was the first, uh, you know, Brazilian national to go to Worlds and, and go to those competitions, so it was really, really fun to be a part of that, like, pioneering process a little bit, um, and to see the sport grow afterwards there, and to see them, like, open up rinks, and they have figure skating schools now, so it was really cool to be the, at the beginning of that. Yeah. Absolutely. And again, I was, I was mentioning uh, before we did the call and at the start of this, uh, you've been on the back to back two very, uh, you know, hit shows, Lock and Key, Yellow Jackets. And obviously people like to say, oh, you know, I watched the first episode and now it's just blown up and it's gotten big. But obviously you've been it, you know, on the inside as a cast member. So how's that experience been of watching both of the shows just blow up, you know, as a, um, a people or, or people have discovered them? Yeah, you know, when when we're making a show, we never really know, right? You never really know right. how it's going to go. You don't know how it's going to turn out because from the moment that you are done um, acting in it, there's so much that happens, right? VFX, post, uh, picture lock, sound, ADR, like color correction. Like there's so many things that can change the way a show looks, feels, is about. And so you really, you trust that you are on the right 
path with the right team and the right show. And, um, but getting to finally watch them come out is a beautiful experience because whenever I'm playing a role, I sympathize with that character. I find the justifications and everything that character does. And I, and I do my best to not judge whoever I'm playing always. But once I'm a viewer sitting in the seat, I'm now yeah. completely surrendering myself to the story. And, you know, like for instance, in this case with yellow jackets, I'm, I'm sitting there wanting to hit Travis over the head 18 times. Right. Yeah. The season, being like, can you please just treat people better? Like, mm. But you know, that's not who he is in that moment. That's not that role. That's not a teenage boy in the nineties going through this stuff. Like, so, you know, you sympathize with it while you're doing it, but it's totally different to see it come together. Now with both those roles, like on Lock and Key and Yellow Jackets, um, it was super exciting to see the response because it with Lock and Key, it was a little different in the sense that it was within a couple of days. So within a couple of days, because Netflix can do that um, with how much bandwidth they have, all of a sudden, the show was just everyone was talking about it and watching it, which was super cool. It was an exciting experience. Now, this experience with Yellow Jackets has been something very different, but also mm. very exciting and feeling because we've watched week after week people building on it and talking about it and telling their friends to watch it. And I'm actually with this show, I'm getting every day, couple of days, I get someone new from my past in my life being like, I just saw this show, but I just hopped on board. I just hopped on board. So to see all these people hopping board onto a season, uh, this first season and, and a series that I'm so proud of to be a part of like this, uh, this entire cast, like they are tremendous. And so to be a, just, just, just to be in like a, a list of names with them and to work with them was, uh, was incredible. So uh, I'm loving this kind of slow build that, that Yellow Jackets has had and, and, and how well it's doing and uh, really thankful for it all. Yeah. And obviously like you mentioned the cast and it's a very, you know, stacked uh, group of people to be working with, obviously. Uh, Christina, Ricky, and Tawny Cypress, just some examples. But, like, was there anyone you were like particularly nervous or like in, you know excited to work with when you knew that they'd be in the show as well? Um, when I look at a, a cast, I just I think anyone can surprise you. Like when you're working with people, so um, I try not to get too attached. Like, oh, I really want to work with this person, this person. But I will say that uh, Melanie Linsky, when I first mm. met Melanie was such a breath of fresh air it's just like yeah. such a, a beautiful human inside and out and so kind and and I just want to work with her now and like I haven't gotten to on the show as of yet but it's like one of those things where I just I I, I would love that in some capacity just because uh yeah it makes me excited to see someone who is such a great human doing so well mm. and I think it's actually it's great for her obviously because in such a I think there's a tendency if you do something for so long people kind of tend to see you in that mold and she spent so many years on two and a half men as this very kind of distinct character and I mean I think if you're like looking at the characters of this show you know you wouldn't you know jump to that straight away as being the right person but I, I think she's doing a great job for sure. Oh yeah such a professional and and so much depth to the to a role that is so complex like Shauna is so complex and I think every character on the show really is and you know if you really take the time to see what each person's been through and what they're dealing with like it's really difficult material at times and yeah Melanie does it with such grace I, I yeah it's indescribable when I watch her work like her and Warren together as well Warren like the newest episode like it's just mm. Yeah, I, I sit there as such a big fan of the show. Like I forget, I forget about being a part of the show. I'm just such a big fan of everyone's work. So it's uh it's it's an exciting experience to see everyone though. The entire cast is brilliant. The young cast, the 20, uh, the 2021 cast, the 1996 mm. cast. It's it was it, it's cool to be a part of the process with them, but now to get to like watch and enjoy their work. Yeah, and obviously being like a, a newer show of the two that we were talking about, people might be like less familiar with it than lock and key but I, you know we've kind of danced around what it's about in that it's you know parallel not, not parallel but it's like focusing on some of the same characters in two different points in time the 90s on present day relatively speaking and you're in the 90s portion of the story but like how would you kind of say to anyone who hasn't seen the show but might know you like how does your character affect that part of the storyline yeah, I have a really hard time uh, describing the show itself because I think the show is so uh, genre bending and like yeah, I, I think it's I think it's like eight genres in one in the best way humanly possible. Um, so describing the show is really tough for me. I just tell people you got to trust me and just watch it. But when it comes to my character uh, Travis, I think um, the best description I can give people is 
that he is a really confused person who um, who creates, you know, in some ways a, a fairly toxic relationship right from the start in this in this story arc and, and it's put in a situation that makes him a very uncomfortable and he doesn't act accordingly with that. He doesn't, he doesn't know how to act in those situations mm-hmm. and acts out quite a bit. Um, but then I try not to give away anything with the 2021 storyline when it comes to Travis, cause I think it's just too exciting of a mm-hmm. plot point. Um, but I make sure everyone kind of knows like, yes, uh, you are going to hear about Travis in 2021. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I guess uh, keep your eyes out, you know, ears to the ground, and uh, I guess uh, we'll see what happens, and you know, with Travis in that part of the story. Obviously, just kind of touching on what you said, and I know obviously acting, you're being something different uh, to yourself, like who you are in real life. But when you play a kind of like toxic character, like do you worry about people kind of just, you know taking out their anger on Travis on, onto you at all? Is that something that crosses your mind? Um maybe crosses my mind for a second, but you know, when I'm, when I'm doing the role, no, I think when we're shooting the role, I don't think about it for a second. I don't need him to be incredibly likable because that's just not who he is or how he's acting in that moment. So Mm -hmm. I'm committed to that 100% when we're doing the work, obviously when I'm watching the show, you know, just scrolling through Twitter, watching people hate on Travis on a Mm day-to-day basis, I agree with them in many senses. So it's hard for me to, you know, I, I don't take it personally. Definitely not. Um, uh, if anything, I, you know, it kind of makes me go like, I'm glad people are seeing the sides of the other sides of him. And, and, um, and I think I try my best to separate myself from the roles once I've done them. Like I, I really do. Um, Cause, and, and yeah, I, I haven't had any instances where people have really confused me in real life for my roles. Mm. We'll see if that changes in the future as the show <laughs> builds, but, uh, mm. but as of now I'm, I'm, I'm pretty content with the response and and I definitely sympathize with everyone who is going like Travis get your act together because I I feel the same way everybody <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure I think it's the famous like thing that some actors say where they're asked if they like their character they say well not at all apart from the fact that I look like them you know like you can't help looking like the character and even no matter what Travis does you know you've got his face and that's you know yeah. for, for better or for worse that's just how it is you know yeah and it's, it's just one of those things where um, I'm, I'm just happy that the work is believable enough for everyone that they do make those comparisons and, and that the story is so well written. And I really do believe that Bart Ashley wrote such a complex, intricate role um, that that I think is completely misunderstood in some senses, but also needs, a, you know, a, a, a talking to, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Um, but uh, yeah, needs some education in that sense. Yeah. But I believe that uh, that it's such a complex role for its time period, and mm. um, and and I've just been very thankful to be able to portray him. Uh, so I, I yeah I don't I don't think about it too much because in in any situation I, I'm more thankful than anything else. Yeah, and obviously you know it goes without saying that like uh, in real life in the in the 90s that you would have been younger than tra- you're, you're portraying Travis as. So like, how much do you remember of like? The stuff that's being explored in that in that time you, you being younger than you're playing on the show if that makes sense yeah i think luckily i grew up during a time like in the early 2000s let's say i believe 90s television was still so big right mm. so i grew up watching so much 90s television that i it, it allowed me to have a little bit of a deeper understanding um plus i did some research and i just looked through some things before i did the role just just to make sure and and i spoke to the team the creative team and i was so lucky Mm. to have a meeting with the creative team right before we started shooting and so i got to kind of discuss like some questions and some thoughts as to where we were going to go with the role and and so it, it felt like a very collaborative easy process to figure out like i remember even in episode two, there's a scene where Natalie comes up to Travis and asks to where his brother is. And he pretty much blatantly says a big plot point and, and then mm-hmm. says like, leave me alone pretty much and much uh, not so nice version of that. But yeah, um, but I just remember having the writers on set and us actually going to the screen and talking about it with Jamie Travis, the director, Ashley Lyle, the writer and going like, is this too far? Is this not enough? Like, where are we starting so that we know where we're going? And mm-hmm. and so to have those conversations made it so easy to figure out where on the spectrum of in the 90s he was. Absolutely. And because you've like had the experience of doing both, like Lock and Key, having source material and this being, you know, written for television directly, like, uh, have you seen a difference in how the material is handled or approached when there isn't like a pre-existing source? Um, I think it's definitely different 
but I would say that lock and key um, really created its own world within the world that it had, that it felt almost new, like new material. And for me specifically, Javi is not a character directly in the, uh, the, the books of right. Lock and Key. Got, got it. He's yeah. inspired by some characters, but he's not directly a character. So it was a little bit more like, yeah, it was a little bit more like a new role mm. in that sense. So I didn't have that like clear source material to work with for this specific role. So it felt similar in that sense, but I definitely think it was nice to have the source material to kind of work with, mm. but in many ways, not having it created more collaboration, I believe for yeah. this one, it created more conversation with Bart and Ashley and Jamie and each director about like, where, where is this coming from? Where is this happening? And, and we luckily had some uh, really cool directors that we got to work with over the first season that definitely understood what was happening and where the story was going. And, and we're also fans of the show. So it was cool just to, mm just to be a part of a group of people that really wanted to make this show, you know? Yeah. And, you know, it's an interesting perspective, like not being from the original source material, like, you know, playing a character like that. Cause like, if you knew that the comic book ended or your character, like being alive, you're like, Oh great. I've got a job for however many <laughs> seasons this, this runs for. Whereas, you know, Oh, right. You know, I get killed in the second issue. I guess I won't be here very long. So like, was there like some sense of freedom that, you know, it literally could have gone any direction because, you know, there was, there was that freedom. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, I think this, the freedom of not, not knowing is beautiful in some ways. Like I remember when I spoke first spoke with the producers and, and creators of the show, Jonathan, Ashley and Bart, they asked me like, what do you want to know? Mm. And I just remember my answer was, I only need to know things from his past that we're going to find out in the future. I don't need to know anything in the future mm. because he doesn't know that he's willing to get there yet or what's going to happen there or whatever it is. But I'd love to know if there's anything we're going to find out about his past. I'd love to know that so that it can inform his decisions now, but it is free to feel like this can go anywhere. In an episode from mm. now, he could completely reinvent himself. You know, this role could completely reinvent himself within one episode, two episodes, because as people, that's human nature. As we learn, as we grow, yeah. as we change, like we, we reinvent ourselves. And I believe that, um, you know, there's room for Travis in that sense to, on a date, on an episode to episode basis. I've even seen it within a couple episodes. Like he does try and reinvent himself time and time again throughout this series. And sometimes he fails. And sometimes mm. he succeeds, but I think uh, I think that's that's good storytelling. Yeah, and I've got a feeling you probably know like Travis's uh, future just based on things that you said to me, right? I get that sense, but obviously, like you know, maybe disregarding that for a second of like putting that to one side, like you know, speaking like uh, you know, um, if you if you could advise Travis based on where he is now, like you know, obviously because like you said, he doesn't know where he's going. If you didn't know, if you just stay in the moment with him, like what would you be? kind of telling him or like advising him, uh, you know, based on where he is in the story at the moment. Well, so, you know, episode nine just came out and, uh, and we have about one episode left. And so mm. um, I'll go based on that. Like if I was sitting Travis down at this moment and, and needing to have a chat with them, um, whether it was 1996 or 2021, I would, I would say, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated, not the way that you feel like you should, mm. like not the way that you feel like you need a defense mechanism for. And the bigger thing is after, after nine specifically, I would, I would definitely give some advice and say, don't shut people out that care about you now. Mm. Shut those people out now, because this is about to get difficult and this is going to keep being difficult as, as we know how long this lasts, um, it's going to be difficult. And so, you know, you got to have people that you talk to. Um, and I think he just doesn't, I think he pretends like he knows everything when he doesn't know anything. Mm. And so, um, I think that would be my advice if I was, you know, sitting him down and saying, treat people better, talk to people that care about you and, and, and actually try and make good decisions for everyone around you, not just yourself. Yeah. And obviously with such like, you know, an intense and like pressure driven world that we're in, 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 in the 2020s, do you think Travis would have, you know, been able to cope? Uh, you know that much in, in, in this period in, you know whether he makes it here or not well it's it's tough it, you know to, to to i think everyone's having a hard time coping never mind Let, let's talk about the real world where we're True. at right now i think everyone's having a really tough time coping never mind with what uh, a group of individuals like this flight would have gone through you know for 19 months in, in the wilderness mm -hmm. and so um Again, I, I think it really does come down to surrounding yourself with the right people and communication. And it does seem like Travis doesn't really have that 
he doesn't have that communication with people. You know, if we look at him and his brother on the show, there's not even a lot of communication between them that's honest and true there. And I, I think a lot of Travis's communication is dishonest and not true. And so, mm. um, you know, we always hope that, that, that people can talk to the right people, find the right people around them. In this case, I, I don't think he has that. Very similarly mm. to, um, to Juliette Lewis's character, the future Natalie, who, right. who really doesn't have those people around them to to really help and and be a part of their lives now partially that's pushing people away secondly mm. that's just you know not not having that same luck so there's you know i think the show touches on that in a few episodes and so that's really nice and and, and i hope that our show also kind of promotes people to go find people to talk to and that are good for them because they can see where that leads to when they don't you know, even if their intentions are good, because I think I do believe that at some points in this show, Travis's intentions are good, but right. he is really not good at dealing with stuff. He's, mm. and, he's and he's not good at, 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 you know, deducting what's the right thing to do in a moment. He's a reactive person and it's uh, it's toxic, you know? Mm. Yeah, I think in a sense, you've kind of hit on the head of why people might go into acting or any kind of storytelling, because Travis is a character, but, you know, with any character, there's experiences relatable to real life and people could see themselves in these characters, even if these actual events are fictitious, there's something normally for people to take away from from stories, I would yeah. think. Yeah, and, and especially in our story, you know, we're talking about a situation that I don't think, I, I hope most of us will never, ever have to go through yeah, what these people have gone through. But yeah, I believe that like the raw feelings that they have for being alone, being individuals, being stranded, feeling secluded, all those feelings that they have in some capacity, like we can find them in our everyday lives, especially with the world the way it is right now. And so um, I think we can find a little bit of ourselves. And, and you know what, sometimes we have to be honest and say like, it's the worst part of ourselves that we're seeing these characters, the part that we feel is the worst, maybe it's not, but yeah. we feel that internally, like it's the worst part of ourselves that we're finding. And, um, and I hope that that's what our story does. And I hope that that's spe specifically Travis. I hope that people see like, Ooh, like I, I kind of sympathize with this horrible behavior because mm -hmm. of deep rooted issues that I have, but that doesn't justify the behavior. That doesn't mean that that behavior is acceptable. It just means that that's what's happened. And that's mm. just the fact of what's happened. And so we got to figure out ways that we can cope better than Travis has. For sure. And maybe on, you know, a slightly lighter note, you know, to kind of, you know, uh, relieve some of this, uh, yeah. you know, uh, deep uh, emotion may maybe coming up. But uh, I know obviously we're just into the new year you know, as when we're recording this, but what would you like to accomplish in 2022? Oh, honestly, I'm I'm really excited just to see what opportunities arise and and just to keep storytelling and and you know hopefully get to spend a little bit more time with family and friends again and, mm. and be a part of that process because I do believe that you know work is work but you need to have a balance no matter whether you love your job like I do or not like I believe that you know you need some balance and, and the right people around you so I'm really lucky I'm really excited to be surrounded by good people I'm I'm really excited to keep storytelling and um and yeah I really have no specific plan as of yet because things have been so changed and up in the air but I have personal plans, personal growth things, goals. Like I, I'm a huge, I'm a massive believer in goal setting. I think anyone right. at any any age, any level doing anything, I think goal setting is the number one thing because if you if you can't at least be honest about what you want, it's going to be really hard to get it anyways. Because mm -hmm. even when you're completely honest and you set the plan and you have good people around you, it's still hard to stay on task yeah. with the things that we want, no matter what. So I think it's really important that we at least do that first step, which is what do I want and how can I get there? And so I'm a huge believer in that. So I'm excited to just tick off some goals and, and keep working on, on things that I want to do and keep learning from my work. It's been a pleasure watching Yellow Jackets because I'm getting to learn even more from my work. And that's really nice. And, and learn from these amazing artists that are on our show. So, uh, and I just want to keep seeing, you know, good material come out and, 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 and hopefully be a part of a lot of things. For sure. And actually to wrap this up, this is the last question I've got for you. And uh, in, like, in like a wider sense, obviously we've covered like your figure skating and lock and key and yellow jackets. But if you could say, you know, anything to those fans of, you know, I guess who have been following along with you as you've gone along in your career, like what, what, what would you want to tell them basically? Like what sentiment would you want to get across? Um, 
mostly that I'm just so thankful at how patient they've been because <laughs> this has been a really long journey in, in my life thus far. And, uh, and I, I can't wait to see everyone's successes. And I hope that their patience in watching my career grow um, also gives them that feeling that they can be patient with themselves as well and, 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 and kind of keep working towards what they want. I'm just, yeah, I'm very thankful that people uh, have been watching the work that, that our work that we've created in different shows and different teams has touched people and, and made them want to follow our careers. And mm. um, I just hope that I don't want anyone to just get lost in my career. I want them to focus on theirs too. Absolutely. And uh, you know, on that note, like where can people find you like online if they want to keep up with what you're doing? Yeah. So um, I have an Instagram. It's Kevin Alves. I have a Twitter. Um, I believe it's the Kevin Alves. And, mm. um, and now I am actually, I haven't really been on TikTok, but my TikTok is going to actually have very soon. I'm going to start throwing on some uh, short BTS videos, kind of like fun cast videos that, that mm. I've got of people while we were shooting from Yellow Jackets. And I'm going to start putting those on TikTok now before I move them to Instagram and stuff. So if they want to get uh, a peek at those, they can uh, follow me on TikTok as well. Absolutely. And I suppose if there's any of, uh, of your fans or other people who want to find this interview or others, uh, I'm on Instagram at, at Courageous Nerd and Twitter at, at underscore Courageous Nerd. But um, I mean, other than that, uh, I guess just to say uh, best of luck with everything you've got, I mean, with your goal setting and with what you hope to accomplish for the rest of this year. Uh, and just thanks again for taking the time, Kevin, and all the best. Take care and stay safe. Oh, thank you. You stay safe and I really appreciate you taking the time. I wish you all the best and, uh, and let's have a great year.